All right, well, we're back. And now let's talk about the primary sex characteristics in boys. So with boys, we're going to be talking about, um, you know, their testes starting to produce testosterone. Um, the testes in their scrotum are going to grow. In fact, if you look at the volume of the testicle from, you know, from infancy is labeled number one um, up through childhood by number three. Early puberty, they're going, the volume is going to have changed across, you know, beads number four through six. And then mid puberty, ultimately by adulthood, the volume of the testicle will be about 25 um, milliliters of volume. Um, so there's a lot of significant testicular growth that's going to be occurring during puberty. Um, so it's, it's not negligible, that's for sure. Um, penis growth is another factor that's going to be occurring during, um, during puberty, and it's going to ultimately reach its adult size. And then spermarchy, which is the male equivalent of menarchy, which is where um, sperm is produced. And in a male, you can actually tell if they're producing sperm by a uh, blood test. But a lot of times males notice it when they have their first ejaculation, either through masturbation or something like that, or through um, a nocturnal emission is what we call it scientifically. Um, most people call it a wet dream where, you know, in while you're dreaming, an ejaculation occurs. Um, so somewhere around 14 is the average age for boys to have, have spermarchy, either blood test detectable or their own personal report. Um, interestingly, spermarchy is not a question that is asked of most boys or men. You know, when, how old were you at first ejaculation is not a question that's usually asked of men. Like it is for women, you know, how old were you when you had your first period? And spermarchy may be an underexplored um, contributor to male health, right? Like we know that menarche has um, a lot of predictive ability for like the, when the onset of uh, menopause will be, for example, for a woman. For, for a woman, typically it's about 40 years between menarche and, and the start of menopause, typically. That's not true for everybody, but typically. For males, we don't know whether there's any kind of association between age of first ejaculation and then declines in testosterone that are really common in adulthood. Like we have no idea if there's any correlation because for some reason, nobody's really been that interested in asking men how old they were when they had their first ejaculation. Um, I think it's probably pretty obvious why that is. With menarche, it's a biological function that you have no control over. With spermarche, the fact that it, we would know about it usually through ejaculation means that now we've got you know a sexual component to the question that makes people kind of squeamish to ask, um, and so we may not we may not be showing a, enough interest in something that might be important because we're a little squeamish to ask people. Um, it's kind of unfortunate, I think, but anyway. So secondary sex characteristics are physical changes that are not necessary for reproduction, but send out a signal to the world that this person is reproductively capable. So if you look at the individuals on this uh, poster or whatever I've pulled off the internet, without looking at their genitals, just looking at them, you can tell just by looking from like, let's say the clavicles up, you could pretty much tell the difference between the mature member of that sex and the, and the immature members. Um, you know, if you look a little bit at their body, like try to cover up the, the proximal areas that you're not seeing their genitals or their, or their chest, but literally just kind of look at their shoulders, their hips, things like that. You can absolutely tell the mature members of that sex from the immature members of that sex, right? Like these are outward signs to everybody else that this person has achieved reproductive capability. So these are not necessary for reproduction, but they aid in reproduction by giving out, you know, accurate symbols, signals. Um, if you imagine that in our ancestral history, perhaps we ran around naked. I don't know if we did or not, but um, if we ran around naked, you can imagine that uh, pubic hair could be a good signal to other people about um, re uh, physical development, you know, physical maturity, having armpit hair, that could be a good signal to other people about whether you're mature or not. Um, so there are a lot of these um, changes that happen to us at puberty that are just a way to send us a message to everybody that this person is reproductively capable. So the secondary sex characteristics are outward signs of maturation, and they do not 
involve reproductive capability. I often have students saying, well, I mean, larger breasts, I mean, that would help to nurture a newborn. The size of the breasts have nothing to do with the ability of the breasts to produce milk for a newborn. If you've ever watched a, pr a primate mother nursing, you wouldn't even notice that she had milk in her mammary areas if her baby wasn't nursing. And then you're like, well, she must, or the baby wouldn't be nursing. They don't have to have larger breasts in order to produce milk. And technically, females of our species don't either. Um, the milk is determined by mammary tissue that um, when full of milk will swell. That's true. But don't need to be swollen in order to start making milk, right? And so um, breasts are larger strictly because of fat that's laid down around them. And so what does that do? Well, it tells other people that this person is mature. Like that's what it does. So um, let's talk a little bit about that. Okay, so I already mentioned breasts for girls, for women. I uh, Normally in class, I like to say, you know, what, what outward signs are really obvious? Pretend like these people have clothes on and what are really obvious changes? Um, and everybody offers breasts. And then, of course, they talk about the hips widening. And the hips do widen um, during development. And uh, But I'd like to point out, a lot of the hip widening that we see between an adolescent girl and an adult woman is fat that's been laid down on the hips and the thighs. And in fact, research has shown that that fat that's on the hips and thighs is really critical for um, nourishing a developing fetus and uh, giving it the proper fat to build up its brain tissue and like that, that the, that that particular fat that tends to get laid down on the hips and the thighs are, is really critical for healthy um, infant development. In our society, we don't really like to think of, you know, fat being on the hips and the thighs, you know, it should be all muscle or, you know, something like that. Um, but it's actually a really good sign to, to men around all around the world prefer the appearance of a female with a waist that is seven tenths the size of her hips. Now, why would that be universally attractive if it weren't some kind of signal of fertility and attractiveness that is, you know, not even re relevant to a culture? It's something all around the world. There's variations around the world about whether large breasts are preferred or smaller breasts are preferred. Um, you know, height of a woman varies by culture as what's attractive and what's not. Everyone around the world, men rate a waist that is seven tenths the size of the hips as attractive, um, which gives an, a, a really clear imp impression that men are looking for signs of fertility. Because if you look at the little girl on the left, her waist is the same size as her hips. If you look at a postmenopausal woman, oftentimes her waist is, is thicker than seven tenths, the hips, hip ratio. Um, if you look at a pregnant woman, her waist is thicker than her, than her hip measurement. Um, having a waist that narrows is an indicator of fertility. And men all around the world recognize that and find it attractive. Um, now for the men's side, so for women, the big changes are the addition of fat to the breast and the addition of fat and a little bit of, um, you know, changing of the orientation of the pelvic bones um, to change the hip appearance. Otherwise, the female adult has a lot of characteristics that are very similar to children. They have smooth faces. They have um, a little bit more fat under their skin than males do of the same age. And so a lot of the things that we see in females are evidence of the absence of testosterone, right? With males, what we have is evidence of the presence of testosterone. So you have the little boy on the, on the far right, his body composition as far as muscle, bone, fat is probably not that different from that of the little girl on the left. Um, they're very similar to each other. But now by puberty, once, pu once they've started going through puberty, the boy on the right in puberty is going to have a lower fat ratio to muscle ratio than the girl who's in puberty on the left. Um, he's starting to feel the effects of testosterone, which helps to shed fat. Um, the subcutaneous fat that makes the body look softer um, tends to be shed at puberty. The adult male is really distinctly different from the boys in the sense that his shoulders are much broader. Um, you can see a little line that they drew on his neck because that's trying to indicate how his um, Adam's apple, we call it um, colloquially, it's... Um, <laughs> I'm having trouble thinking of the scientific word for the Adam's apple. Um, his... Um, throat has a bulge on it is the word I'm looking for. That's not, if there's a term for it. Um, so that's starting to protrude and um, his jawline, look at the jawline of the adult male compared to even the puberty 
male. Um, the jawline starts to get heavy, and it continues to grow uh, throughout um, you know, emerging adulthood. The jawline will continue to get heavier um, in the male, and he will um, start to develop facial hair. Typically, the male will not develop facial hair until he's reached his full height, on average. And so some males who are going to continue growing for quite a while may have, you know, a couple little sparse hairs here and there on their face, um, but they won't really get their beard or their, their full must, mustache until they've reached their full height. That's also genetically determined, by the way. Some people are never going to have very heavy beards, and some will have very heavy beards. It really, it really varies. Um, some people will have hair on their shoulders or their back, and others won't. Um, a lot of that has to do with genes and, and to a certain degree, ethnicity. Like certain ethnic groups have more hair and certain ethnic groups have less hair. Um, so hair in other parts of the body, like the face and the back and things like that, are, are quintessentially male characteristics. That's part of testosterone. Um, females hardly ever have hair on their backs or hair on their faces until maybe after menopause, something like that. So I think I've walked us through these outward appearances that we can cue on to help us to know whether a person is re reproductively capable or not. Um, let's talk psycho psychological then. Um, you know, timing is so tough, right? It's like we know what the sequence is, but we don't know when an individual is going to start that sequence. Uh, if you are much earlier than your peers and you're a girl, it can contribute to lifelong body image problems. Because puberty triggers the holding of fat on the hips and around the breasts, a lot of girls at this point think that they're getting fat. And uh, they're, they're, the people around them might actually say things like that to them, that you're, you know, you're getting fat, you need to exercise more, other things, when this is just their body developing and it's normal. Um, so it can cause them for their whole rest of their life to have poor body image, thinking that they're fatter or, or um, their, their chest is too big or their butt's too big or these other things because of how they viewed themselves when they were going through puberty. Um, it can cause low self-esteem, right, where you're feeling like everybody else looks better or is better or feels better um, than you. And it can contribute to ultimately depression through adolescence and into adulthood where the person's feeling very just like negatively. Um, boys who are earlier than their peers have a lot of behavior issues, like they may be more aggressive. Being bigger oftentimes allows you to be um, you know, more aggressive. Um, people will treat you as older, so maybe the older kids will let you run around with them. And next thing you know, you're involved in law-breaking activities, um, substance use activities that you wouldn't have done otherwise. Um, so looking older, and this is a very modern change. When I first started teaching developmental psychology, and I, I started off by teaching childhood and adolescence, so we really delved into these issues um, at that time. And I was teaching in the early 90s. And back then, the... Um, the early 1990s, yeah, the olden days. Uh, back then, the research was showing that early maturing boys tended to behave in much more mature and um, responsible ways. But nowadays, we're seeing this switch where the boys who are maturing earlier are having these behavior problems. And it's probably because of who they're running around with. You know, if you look older, older people will let you hang around with them. And then you start getting caught up in these um, bad behaviors. Being later than your peers, if you're a girl, contributes to self-consciousness, right? So if everybody else has reached maturity and you haven't gotten any breast development yet, or um, your hips haven't started to develop, or you haven't had your first period, um, it can make girls very self-conscious and worried that other people are judging them and things like that. Um, for boys who are late de developers, they tend to be more anxious than their earlier, not the, not the earliest, but the more you know on-time boys. Um, more likely to be depressed even into adulthood and they oftentimes are very fearful of ever engaging in sex like ever feeling like they can be you know enough for for a woman and so they have a lot of um, self-criticism and um, they'll hold themselves back from potential relationships and things like that because they think they still feel like that that little kid who was not as developed as the other people around them I've always thought it was kind of cruel that just at the time when we're really starting to have our highest levels of self-consciousness and stuff, we're going to be talking about this more when we get to psych, um, psychosocial development, but um, just as we're developing all this self-awareness is exactly when we are supposed to be developing physically and our sense of what we look like and how other people react to us really kind of gets set in adolescence. 
And for the rest of our lives, no matter how much we don't look like that or, or people aren't treating us like that anymore, we still ha carry with us what was sort of encoded on us when we were, you know, in adolescence. It's really kind of harmful and, and unfortunate. I don't know how to get around the problem, um, but it's kind of sad. And I think a lot of us carry those scars with us, whether we were an early developer or late developer, or even if you were considered on time, you know, it's not like we can all just mature simultaneously. There's no such thing as like truly on time. Um, some, you were to some degree earlier or some degree later than the people that you know. Um, so it's, it's something that we carry with us and probably it affects a lot of us, I think. Uh, a lot of us probably carry around some residual adolescent self-doubt, self-consciousness, you know, those kinds of things because of the timing of puberty and how it manifested itself on, our, on us. All right, speaking of manifesting itself on us, let's talk about appearance in our next segment. <laughs> 